Hi, it's Tuesday, June the 27th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Mark's Gospel. Today it's Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 10. Yay, we're starting a new chapter. Uh, we wrapped up chapter 7 with Jesus uh, healing um, a man who was deaf and had an inability to speak. Uh, when all was done, he was open, so he could hear, apparently, and he could speak clearly. Um, anyway, there was lots of wondering about that, at least there was for me. And, uh, well, today we move on, so let's see what happens. Mark 8, verses 1 to 10. In those days there was again a great crowd without anything to eat. He called his disciples and said to them, I have compassion for the crowd, because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from a great distance. His disciples replied, How can one feed these people with bread here in the desert? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. So then he ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and after giving thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples to distribute, and they distributed them to the crowd. They also had a few small fish, and after blessing them, he ordered that these two should be distributed. They ate and were filled, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. Now there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went into the district of Dalmanutha. There it is. There you go. So, does it sound familiar? <laughs> Doesn't it? Just the other day, didn't we? <laughs> um... It's peculiar, right? Because Jesus just fed 5,000. Um, and, you know, it kind of makes you wonder what's wrong with the disciples. They go, well, how are we going to do this? Well, you just did it last week. Um, now, there, uh, I would, I don't know, I want to say the majority of, of scholars. Um, most people, when I talk to them about it, and, and including scholars, will say, well, I mean, it's obviously it's the same story. Mark's just telling the same story again. It's, it's the same incident. The, Jesus didn't feed 5,000 and then a week later feed 4,000. That No, that's not what happened. I, I understand why you say that. I mean, the stories are so similar. But surely Mark knows that, right? I mean, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't one of those situations where your printer went nuts and reprinted page three. And so, you know, you're reading through and going, I've read that page. Oh, I just read that two pages ago. No, Mark has done this intentionally. He has told the story. And then he has told the story again. So either Mark thinks that they are separate events, or the retelling matters to Mark. So the retelling matters to Mark. So you think about it. What's different about this story? Well, 4,000. Right? The other one's the feeding of the 5,000. This is the feeding of the four. Um, why is this a smaller? I mean, you know, did Mark tell the first story? Oh, you know what? 5,000 is too many. No one's going to believe that. Let's tell it again with four. For me, if, if Mark is, is writing this down and Mark is sharing this, Mark has made this about 4,000 people so that we will know that it's not the same as the 5,000. Okay, it's not the same as the 5,000. And yet the disciples still have the same problem, right? Um, Jesus says, we're going to feed these people. How, how can one feed these people with bread here in the desert? You can't, how? how? So, in, um, in an earlier situation... Where the need was even greater, Jesus was able to feed them. And they were part of it. They did that together. Now, in a lesser situation, the need is not as great. It's only 4,000. Now, we talked about this last time. It's 4,000 men. It's 5,000 men. So, assuming that they have families. So, they might have children with them. They may have women with them. There are more people. How many more people? I don't know. Double? Uh... 50% more? I mean, so is four actually five or six? 
or maybe eight, is five, seven, eight, or maybe ten. Um, it's hard to know for sure. So, we'll, but we'll stay with the four and the five for the moment. The thing is, the need is only eighty percent of what it once was. <laughs> But when I wonder about that, I trust God in big things. You know, I really, truly do. But I don't always go to God for the little things. You know, the little petty things. People say, oh, you know, it's... Don't, 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 don't bother God with those little things. God's about the big things. So, and I talked about this just recently. You know, so pray for world peace, absolutely. But, you know... Don't pray about the idiot at work that just gets on your nerves all the time. Why would you? That's just, that's just small potatoes. And I wonder, in the telling of the story, if, 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 if you know, a mirror's not being held up, and I'm looking, you know what? I do go to God for the big things. But I don't go to God for the small things. And I don't know where the line is. I don't know where that line drops off. You know, uh, if my son is deathly ill, I am praying for him. If my son is cranky and has a runny nose, eh, I'm probably not praying for him, right? Um, although I might be concerned. I mean, it just seems to me that, that the disciples don't seem to get that the principle that was true for the big is also true for the smaller. And it wouldn't be an interesting story if it was like eight people. Like, <laughs> it's like, well, eight people are following us. What are we going to do? Uh, no, it, it, there's there's thousands, but but they are they are less the number is smaller than, than, than the previous. It's a smaller crowd. So for me, this is a smaller problem. And it seems that the disciples have forgotten that what worked in the big situation can also work in the small. So when I humble myself before God in prayer, and when I actually let go of my ego and try to, um, to feel where the Spirit is taking me here, what God calls me to, that, that, that I might understand my role in community connection, in, uh, in, in the fight against poverty, in, in, in civil rights. When I try to follow God in that, I, I do, I pray and I'm very open to that. But if I come home and I'm talking about just discontent within my family or disagreements here or there, or I'm dealing with a small workplace issue, it doesn't really occur to me to let go of my ego and just listen for the Spirit and let God guide me. That doesn't occur to me. No, because I'm in charge in the smaller ones. So I wonder if the story isn't a little bit about that. And I really haven't been thinking about this. It's coming off the top of my head, but the connection for that then to me as well is um, Jesus says to them, how are we going to feed these people? And Jesus says to the disciples, how many of loaves do you have? Not how many people do they have, not how, many, not how, many, how much food does the crowd have? Remember in the 5,000, there was a boy that had some food. We used his food. So we're not using their food now. You. What do you have? Oh, no, no. We, we don't have enough for this. Very often in my faith, I expect God to come in for the big things. Um, the small things, one of two things happens. One is I can handle it myself. I don't need God's help. Thanks very much. I'm in charge. I got it. Or it's not quite world peace big, but it's bigger than I can handle. So I can't do this. And so I just let it go. Lots of medium-sized things in my life can be let go because they're too small for me to take to God, but they're too big for me to handle myself. What do you have? Jesus asked them. It's your turn to do this. We did it together before. We can do it together now. What do you have to bring to the table? Oh yeah, I've I've got I've got seven loaves. It says later they also had a few small fish, right? After Jesus sits everybody down, breaks the bread, distributes them, or gets the disciples to distribute it, and everybody's working on this together, uh, which is like the other story too. Uh, but it turns out they also had a few small fish. And I've heard people suggest that the disciples were reluctant to trust Jesus. Say, well, we've got bread, and they don't mention the fish. Um, 
And I think about that and I go, yeah, maybe. Maybe that's why, the way Mark's telling the story, but unless it's salt fish, I'm just telling you, you know what? You're not hiding fish from me. <laughs> if we've been walking together for a couple, three days and you've got fish, yeah, I noticed them. <laughs> I can smell it. <laughs> I may not smell the bread, but I am going to smell the fish. Um, so, it, no, I don't think that they're hiding the fish. I think the thing is that when you discover, when, when you engage in something and you use the principles that you use for the big problems, the, the humility, the letting go of ego, the listening for God, when you take those things and use them for the small things, you also discover, oh my God, I do have, I do have assets and abilities that I didn't even know I had. It's not just seven loaves. I got small fish too. Right. It's not just that I can sit and listen to somebody as, as, as they unload the pain and tell the story of, of, of what brought them into this moment. It's not just that I do that, but it turns out I know something about the situation they're in. I, I actually have been there before. I, I didn't know that we had a connection, but we do, and I can bring that into it as well. So suddenly things we didn't even know we had come into play. When we let go of the ego, when we dare to handle medium-sized or even small problems with the same, in the same way that we handle the big ones. I'm all for handing big stuff over to God. It's little stuff, though. Well, I do myself. I get a sense in the story that, that, that's, that I'm not supposed to separate those things. And you've heard me say this before, I think, because it is something that comes up in my mind quite quite often. You know, we, we do this thing with God where we make God essentially human. Um, but God's not human. Jesus is. But God's not. So to expect God to function as a human does doesn't make any sense, but we do it. That's why we don't take our small, petty problems to God, because... God's busy with the big ones. We don't want to weigh God down. We don't want to distract God down because the way we were with a human being. It's true. If, I got a, if I'm doing a bunch of big things right now, please don't bother with the small things. Absolutely. If I'm doing my income tax and working away, it's not, that's not when I want my four-year-old to show me a card trick. I don't have time for that. I can't. No, I don't have time for that. But God's not me. God doesn't do income tax. <laughs> and God already knows how your card trick works out. But the thing is, God isn't limited the same way that I am as a human being. So God has the capacity for the great big things. God, please, how do we deal with racism? How do we live into a better future? How do we bring sides that are so disparate, so far apart? How do we actually bring them together? Where is the place where we can stand and be siblings together and not just enemies screaming at each other? I don't know how to solve that. I take that to God. I have no problem taking that to God. But God, why is it on the way into work? I just I lose my temper every morning. I just want to yell at traffic. What's I, I don't take that to God. I know what that is. That's the idiot drivers in front of me. Or it's the fact that I'm tired. Or it's the fact that I just got a lot of stress and so I'm already angry first thing in the morning. Oh, uh, no, yeah, I've figured it out. Great. I haven't done anything about it, by the way, but I have figured it out. It's referred anger coming out of stress. But what if... In humility, I went to God and said, God, I, I don't want to be angry in the mornings anymore. I don't want to shout in traffic. I don't want to start my day on edge and angry. No, I want I want the peace that I had a year ago, God. I, I want to breathe easy. I want to feel okay. God, please, please help me because I don't know how to do this. If I use that principle, I might discover that I find a way to drive to work that doesn't involve yelling. By the way, I'm not actually someone who yells at traffic uh, on a regular basis. I do it once in a while. Uh, it's not an issue for me. I just uh, I pick something. Um, so before you write down, oh, yeah, see, like, yells in traffic. Nah, actually not my thing. Um, and I'm not telling you what my thing is. <laughs> so, so what's different, as I say, is that it's smaller. Uh, the bread and ultimately the fish are coming from the disciples, not from the crowd. That happens, too. You know, and and I mean, there, there's a time where when we're expected to participate 
not to our detriment, but at our cost. This faith thing, seeing Jesus do miracles, is working with Jesus, yeah, it, it's great. But every now and again, you got to step it up too. Every now and again, you got to bring the loaves. Every now and again, you got to pick up a check. Right? Every now and again, you have to be part of that. Uh, this, this life of faith and the way we want to live in a neighborly way will cost us from time to time. And the cost, by the way, totally worth it. But there is a cost. Every now and again, Jesus will look and say, so how many loaves have you got? And then you got to come up with the loaves. I can take that out of the story. Maybe that's why Mark told the story. Because he told the story the first time, uh, and 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 there was another time, but he wasn't going to tell the story because it started the same. But you know what? But I'm going to tell the other story because now I have a chance to emphasize actually, yeah, no, the bread came from the disciples because it's important to know that we need to contribute fully to this ministry. To know that living a life of faith actually does have a cost. It's not free. It costs. I remember, um, oh, a very long time ago. And I wish I could remember who the, th the theologian was. Uh, but it's fairly common. Uh, you know, just discussing, you know, the truth shall set you free. And this idea, too, that there's great freedom in faith. There's freedom uh, in being, you know, at one with God. Uh, freedom in Christ, they'll talk about all those things. Um, and, and we often interpret that as just like, yeah, freedom means I don't have to do anything. I have no obligations. Nothing's on me. I'm done. It's like, no, that's not the freedom we're talking about when you're in faith. There is a great freedom to this life of faith. My relationship with God absolutely invites me to be free. My, my relationship with Jesus absolutely insists that I live freely. Free to love the neighbor. Free to live out my faith. Not fettered by ego, concerns for security. No, no, no. Real freedom is when I can just be authentically, completely for the neighbor. That's the freedom we're talking about. But that freedom has a cost. That's not free from paying. It's not, oh, no, every lunch is free now. It's not that. I'm free to be for others. I don't need to be afraid. I don't have to prove myself because I belong to God. God's love is enough for me. Hmm. This time there was a cost to the disciples. They didn't just get a ringside seat to the miracle. They had to come up with the loaves. And then you know what? There's just the truth that every now and again you live this life of faith and it just seems like, is, is this happening again? Is this happening again? Sometimes it's good things. Sometimes it's bad things. Is this happening again? Oh man, is it another birthday cake? Could we not just have a birthday just the other day? Oh, man, does everyone in the office get a birthday? Uh, does everyone in the church get to have a... Do we have to sing happy birthday to every... Why don't we just sing it every Sunday? You, you get into a habit where, 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 where things keep happening again and again and again and again. But that is what happens. I'm not saying you should sing happy birthday every Sunday or ever, frankly. Um, but you get into this thing where, where, where there seems to be a rhythm to it and just these things seem to happen again and again and again. Uh, and that happens in faith. Um, and, and so do the frustrating things. Oh, man, are we doing this again? Do we have to have that same budget discussion? Oh, why every year, why do we have to fight over the nickels and dimes and not look at the big picture? Right? Well, that is part of faith. Because we do come back to things again and again, and we are called on to love, and we are called on to pay attention, uh, and we are called on to look for God in the moment, right? Not in the story that we tell about the last time we did it, but look for God in this moment. Because you know what? The details might have changed a little bit. Maybe it's only 4,000 people. Maybe someone here's got seven loaves of bread. Never know. Um, but you got to look again and again. Yeah, sometimes the life of faith can lull you into saying the same things, feeling the same way about all the same people all the time. But that's not really feeling, is it? It's not really acknowledging the people. It's not even really being you. Hmm. Wow, I don't know how I got there from this text. 
But I did. Because even things seem the same, it's when we stop to look closely, we realize that they're not the same. Each telling of the story has something to offer. Something new, when we dare to wonder about it. Oh my goodness, that sounded like an ad. So you know what? I'm going to stop right now. That's it. It's been 20 minutes. Um, so you know what? Let me just offer a prayer and then leave this, uh, this rerun with you. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you. We thank you for stories that come around again and again. Friends that come around. Love that comes around familiar, and yet if we truly pay attention, we discover a little different every time we engage. So God, we thank you for today's engagement and for whatever has sprung anew. We ask God that that our wondering today, that our prayers, that our, our moments all help us grow in faith. May they all bring us closer to you. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's it for me today, but I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Until I do get to see you, God bless you. Please know that God sees you and loves you exactly as you are and where you are. And please know that God's love moves through you out into the world in amazing ways. God bless you. See you tomorrow.